We're going to continue in our study of First Peter. Peter's letter to the believers that are scattered abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, all in Turkey. We're going to read verse 3, and we're going to finish at verse 12. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Today's service of communion it's a great reminder of the eternal value of our salvation. That it is based on the blood of Christ. That it is based on the suffering and the future glory of Christ that was predicted by the prophets. And it was proclaimed by those who witnessed, including Peter himself, witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus though from afar, and the ascension into heaven, and the day of Pentecost, and the spreading of this gospel to the Samaritans and to the Gentiles, to anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, to anyone who has faith. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy begotten us again, born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A lot of people have hope in a lot of things. But one thing is certain. If you've been born of God, by the Spirit of God, you will be resurrected. And you will not be resurrected unto condemnation, which the majority of people will be but you will be raised unto the resurrection unto life, often expressed as life eternal, everlasting life. You will, not to, you will not go where corrupt things go, and you will not be corrupted, but rather you will go where everything is pure, authentic, real, where just as the streets are like paved with gold, the city will be full of people, that are glorious, triumphant, undefiled, incorruptible. Heaven will be filled with people that cannot sin, cannot disappoint God, cannot even be tempted. 
is such a great hope. When I was thinking of Patricia and her great faith, as I listened to my wife share from Facebook, she has a group of 10 or 12, I think, something like that. Something like that? 10 texting. And just encouraging each other, knowing the end is coming. And she's not that old. She's my age. I'm just a pup. And she's had a great life. And she's got many, many grandchildren. And uh, she's got a great life. Got a husband who really loves her. But her hope is no longer in the farm. Her hope is no longer in in being able to see her grandchildren graduate. Her hope is no longer seeing her children, her grandchildren marry. It could happen. It could happen. God could do a miraculous work in her. But she has a sure hope than those things, which would be wonderful if she could experience them. But she has something far more certain in those things. The resurrection from the dead. And though it says that you may suffer, perhaps, for a while, and you'll be tested by fire, my hope is that my wife and I, sometime before we're so miserable that we can't stand each other, we still love each other, We'll just lay in bed together and just agree, let's just go to heaven together. And we'll just go to sleep together. That would be my dream. I'll be 112 then. But, <laughs> but that'll be my dream. That's how I want to go out. That's the way I want to go out. But I don't have a lot of say in that. I don't have a lot of say in that. But I do know, for those who are born of God, we have a hope that is not wishful thinking, that it would be nice if it happened, that it would be great if this could be so. We have a hope of certainty, absolute certainty, based on the testimony of Jesus, based on his life, based on his brutal crucifixion, based on the fact that he was buried on the third day he was raised and over 500 saw him based on the fact that he was ascended and the apostles saw him after 40 days coming in and out among them into the clouds, into the heavens, of which the angel said that he will come back in the clouds. But before that day of coming back in the clouds, God put him at the right hand and the people saw the Spirit of God coming down in the most powerful and unique way on the day of Pentecost, of which this writer was the preacher and preached and over 3,000 men came to faith in one sermon, not including women and children. And he wants to remind all of us that the Lord is faithful. On that sermon, he quoted the Psalms because he knew that the Psalms included David, and David was a prophet. And, and that prophet had predicted that you will not allow your anointed one to be corrupted. And he pointed out that David, we know where his tomb is. David was not just speaking of himself. He was speaking of himself, but he was speaking of someone in the future whom God would not allow him to be in the grave to the place where he would be, his flesh would be utterly corrupted, turned to dust. And Peter made it very clear that David was a prophet. And David's psalms were not just for his day to encourage the people of his day, but they were written so that the people of Jesus' day and all the days after Jesus would know that David was a servant for that generation that would know that a prophet spoke of this coming Messiah, that he would die, he would be buried. But God would not allow his body to become corrupt and turn to dust. And on the third day, God raised him from the dead. And he also quoted Joel in that sermon, the writer of this letter. 
And he pointed out that Joel looked to a day, hundreds of years in the future, when God would pour out his spirit, not just on a few, but all Israel. All Israel. To as many as come upon, uh, call upon the name of the Lord. Men servants, maid servants, men, women, young people, old people. There would be no difference. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord by faith received the Spirit on that day. And now by the time Peter writes this letter, he had two more experiences where God used him to give the Spirit to the Samaritans. And then God gave him the experience of, of being the one that saw the Spirit come down upon a Gentile who was not part of the commonwealth of Israel at all and recognized that with God there is no favoritism. It truly is that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and will have this great hope. Why should a Samaritan with all their issues and all the things they've got wrong theologically assume that they'll be part of that great day in the future? Because they came to faith in Jesus. Well, how do we know they actually came to living faith? Because the Spirit of God came upon them. And anyone who has the Spirit of Christ belongs to Christ. And how do we know the Cornelius, the old good man? How do we know that he actually has a unique relationship with God? Because the Spirit of Christ came upon him too. Apart from becoming a Jew through circumcision. And so Peter knows that this salvation is secured by faith. He also knows that you might suffer for a little while. That's possible. He was beat up in front of the Sanhedrin for his faith. He and John were told to no longer speak of Jesus. And he felt that, that was to ask, they were asking too much. So he kept speaking about Jesus and the church kept increasing, though at that time completely a Jewish church. And it was growing, it was growing, and it really upset the Sanhedrin. So they brought John and Peter, the two of them, in front of them and they slapped them around and beat them up and warned them to stop speaking in the name of Jesus. And all Peter could say was, you men will have to decide whether it's right to obey God or men. And even Gamaliel, the teacher of Apostle Paul, who eventually becomes the Apostle Paul, knew that if this is from God, you can't stop it. You can beat these men up and you can kill them. You can do what you want. But if this is actually from God, these people suffering will not bring this to an end. Because it's a sure hope. It's a promise that God has given those who believe in Jesus. And why would a man stand before Sanhedrin knowing that if he shows up, they're going to hurt him? Why not run? Lots of time to run. Why stay in Jerusalem? Because he knows the most important thing is that he testifies that Jesus is the, the Christ. Why have the pastors in Iran not run? Why did they stay with their flocks? They knew they were a target. Hundreds and hundreds of Iranian pastors in jail. They knew they were a target. They knew they'd be the first to be picked on. They knew they'd be the first to be put in prison. They knew they'd be the first to lose their heads. They knew they would be the first to be denied access to their children, their families, their grandchildren. Why did they stay? Why didn't they run? Because they knew that their faith had to be tested. And if they ran, what would the sheep think? What would the sheep think? When I was in Nizhny Novograd and I saw in Nizhny Novograd a beautiful mural downstairs longer than that wall there, about that length, but that high, of just a huge picture of a Baptist church in Russia. 
during the time of Stalin. Beautiful church. Must have had four or five hundred people, which is like 12 Russian families. <laughs> they, had, they were like Mennonites. They just had huge families, 14, 16 kids. Wonderful. All in black. Don't think that uh, the Mennonites have uh, the monopoly on black. The Russian Baptists had it. <laughs> or Pat, yes. Or Arnie. <laughs> Got some blue on today. but And... And they were smart because they didn't want the young people in their church. This is a brand new church. They took, a, they took old phot photographs of the old congregations and put it at the basement so that all the people who didn't know anything about the church's history in Nizhny Novograd would not forget. Now, they, these families were not the product of those families. Stalin exterminated them all or sent them to Siberia. But a church planter came in from just south of Moscow, from Bryansk, and reestablished a church in that city. And they wanted to testify to the people. There's a great legacy of people whose faith was tested, and it was true. Why did the elders not run? They knew that Stalin would pick on them first. Why did they not leave the flock and hide in their Tens of thousands of places you can hide in that part of the place of Russia. It's just massively big with woods. It'd take you years to go and trump out the ground at that time to figure out where you hid. But they didn't. And so they had this beautiful picture. And if you keep going, then they have the pictures of the same men that look so proud of their church. And they're all in the gulag. And they've got stripes and they're sitting on their bed and there's a picture of all the elders and the pastors in this gulag in a camp being worked to death of which virtually none of them came back. And they wanted the church to know though they were not the relatives of them they were an example for the church in Nizhny Novograd the Baptist church that had been replanted. It's a, it's a city of three million people and they have less than 1,100 Baptists. And that's virtually all of your Christians in the entire city. But it was virtually down to like a handful. And they wanted them to understand your faith is about a faith that if God be willing, you may not suffer. But you have to be willing to suffer if need be. You have to be true. And that's what Peter's saying. Peter's not saying you will for certain suffer, but it might. And if it does happen, if it does happen, it is your opportunity for your faith to show the world that your hope really isn't in keeping yourself alive. Your hope really isn't avoiding powerful religious leaders from embarrassing you. The Orthodox Church was very cruel to the Baptists and they've ranked it up again as they've joined Putin to persecute the Baptist Church in Russia. Throwing more and more pastors, just sent a Pentecostal pastor to jail for a long, long, long time simply because he's Pentecostal for no other reason. They removed violence as a terrorist crime so that peace-loving Christians can now be thrown in jail under the same law as a terrorist because they're against the state because they will not embrace orthodox teaching Russian orthodox teaching I know two of these fellows they're both pastors when I was there young fellows gave up their business both planting churches and they know that the government knows everything about them everything about them they follow their computers they follow all their emails why do they not run? As the, when I was in Nizhny, it wasn't too bad because you could actually hand out Bibles. That's done. You could have uh, playgrounds where children could send and as long as none of the families complained, you could have open air Bible studies with children under 18. A child is under 18. Now, you cannot share your faith with anyone. Period. Doesn't matter what age you can be charged. Have they stopped sharing their faith? 
No. No. Are they smart? Yes. Do they go around handing Bibles out in the, in, in the square? No. That doesn't make any sense now in any of the places. But they have hope. I remember when I was there with Cher and I watched their youth group and the youth group got together and the primary reason for a youth group to get together, when I say youth group, it starts at 18. They'll shove some 15, 16 year olds in there but they'll pretend they're 18. <laughs> because 18 at that time was the legal age. Otherwise you're seen as bringing propaganda to children. And the number one thing they would do for activities was prayer marches. They would go to different parts of the city and pray for city, for this huge city. Remember one, we went on one and they prayed for a section of Nizhny Novograd that had 400,000 people without a Bible study. 400,000 people without a Bible study, let alone a church. And they asked God that, that God would do something in that part of the town. It was across the Volga River to get there. Prayed around. Often they would um, do children's ministry. Often they would used to hand out Bibles. God wants us to put our hope in the things that matter. This is a great covenant we have. It's far better than the old covenant. But let me explain something. The Abrahamic covenant, originally God said this. Before one Hebrew had come into existence, he said that you will be afflicted for a period of 400 years and then you'll come out with great wealth and power and I'll punish those who do you wrong. Meaning the Abrahamic covenant is based on my people will first suffer and then they will enter into glory and vindication. That is the Abrahamic covenant. It's the foundation for both the Mosaic covenant and the new covenant. Now the Mosaic covenant is of this nature. It is only for Israel and it was this promise. If you keep my laws, which remind you of who did this great work of salvation, the vast majority of laws and Mosaic law are about don't forget who saved you. Don't attribute it to some other God. Eat food that reminds you of what I did. Put on clothes that reminds you what I did. Just do everything that I say so you never forget what I did for you, that I kept my promise to Father Abraham. That if, if you obey, you will never suffer. You will never suffer. You will defeat the giants. You will own land. You won't have to borrow. You will never suffer. You will lend, not borrow. Your land will be the land of milk and honey. He promised them this. You'll have no diseases. You will have no famine. No stillborn children. No stillborn animals. If you obey my laws, you will have no suffering in your land. Period. And so God puts out this wonderful carrot. He says, if you will obey my laws, you will live in absolute comfort and security. No pain. You will all live tremendously long. And you ask yourself, why did Israel not take it up and do it? And for hundreds of years, it became quite evident that Israel, with this offer, wasn't going to do it. And they didn't. And they didn't obey God. And they forgot God's salvation. And so God brought suffering into them. Not because the Mosaic law wants to bring in suffering. If you obey the law, it brings in blessing. But what the law pointed out was the knowledge of our sin. That even when God gives you all the hope of not suffering, a people still cannot obey him and choose not to obey him. And they forget his salvation. So then God made a second covenant called the Davidic covenant where he said, I will put a man after my own heart on the throne and he will force these people not to worship idols and forget who I am. He will have an army to make sure this nation does not build high places and worship other gods in public. And so he established David. But then that covenant was in trouble because the sons of David, the later kings, didn't care to actually make sure that people obeyed the law. 
And so what happened was that in the Mosaic law and in the Davidic covenant, what happens is there's an Israel within Israel because Israel does not want to obey. For those who do want to obey, they suffered. People who said, you know, guys, we shouldn't worship idols. And Israel started killing those people. Guys, we shouldn't forget the Lord. And they started persecuting those guys. And then God sent prophets and said, don't, for, don't forget the Lord. And don't add other gods. And don't pretend that salvation was based on your own strength. And there was an Israel within Israel. So even in the Mosaic law, whether before or after King David, there was a sense that the true Jew understood that there was suffering if you were faithful to God. Not because the Mosaic law promised suffering. It came because Israel refused to obey. But here's the new covenant. It actually promises you suffering. It assumes the whole world will not obey the gospel. You come in not with the hope that one day every single person on the planet will obey the gospel, but rather you're going to be true to the gospel and it's going to feel like being treated like a criminal. And that's why the gospel is symbolized by the cross. It's symbolized by the cross. Peter knows all about this. Eventually he is martyred for his faith. This was foreseen by God that Jesus would come and that he would suffer. We are the true Israel. We are the true Jew. We are participants of this Abrahamic covenant that said you will first suffer then you will enter into your glory and I will vindicate you like Jesus. The prophets are so important for us to read. Be familiar, people, with the prophets. Know what, just, know what Hosea says. Know what Micah says. Know what Joel says. Know what David says. Is on the day when trials come, your faith will not be just based on what some few fishermen have to say. And when God asks you to, to put hope in him when all other avenues of hope are taken from you, it is your confidence that what Jesus spoke and what Peter proclaims is based on hundreds of years of the prophet saying, this is so. And we are the people that they were ministering to even though they don't know us. They didn't know us. They knew we were in the future. They knew there was a people coming in the future that would experience a radical change in our very nature which the Bible calls being born of God. It's such a radical thing to be born of God that you're willing to pick up a cross, deny yourself and not be bitter when God takes things from you because he's offering you so much more than he takes away. He takes away your ability to maybe hold your grandchildren to see them graduate. He takes away your ability to experience some things that every person would want to experience. But we're not bitter because we know that we have a hope that's alive, it's living, it's eternal, it's forever, it's based on Jesus, it's based on the apostles, and, it, and it's made absolutely certain because it's based on the Abrahamic covenant that God made with him, the covenant God made through Moses, the, God, the covenant God made through David, but most importantly, the covenant that God made through Jesus. And we know a covenant God would make with Jesus will never be broken, ever be broken. We have a certainty. Let's take communion knowing that we have a certainty of good times forever.